started. Okay. So uh, before I introduce our special guest, John Younger, I uh, just want to let you know my name is Sandra Reimer, and I am the founder of Co-Labor Nation. And welcome to the Factors of Freelance Success Q&A with John Younger. This, before we get started, I want to tell you what to expect. Uh, this afternoon's session will begin with a brief introduction to Co-Labor Nation. Then Dr. Younger will give a summary of the findings of the 2021 Global Study on Freelancing, which was conducted among 1,900 freelancers in more than 30 countries, including Canada. After the presentation, you can unmute yourself and ask a question or post a question in the chat. Also, as uh, your questions occur, occur and you're thinking of them, feel free to post them in the chat and I'll read them out when the Q&A time comes. Okay, so briefly, I just want to tell you about what Co-Labor Nation is. And I'm glad we have lots of our members joining us right now. Uh, Co-Labor Nation is an online community of Canadian freelance marketing and communication professionals who collaborate to provide complete solutions for clients. Our members include digital marketers, writers, videographers, graphic designers, photographers, web designers, social media content creators, even Google Ads specialists, marketing strategists, and other freelance specialists. And Co-Labor Nation freelancers range in experience from just beginning to experts in their fields. Our community is a source of Canadian freelance talent for, freelance, for businesses and nonprofits who need help with their marketing. And at the end of the session, I'll tell you where you can find us. Now it's my privilege to introduce our presenter, John Younger. John is an author, teacher, and early stage investor in the freelance space. He's also the founder of Agile Talent Collaborative. John is the co-author of Agile Talent and several books in talent manage management and HR leadership. He writes the Freelance Revolution blog for Forbes.com, is a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review, Talent Quarterly, and other publications. He sits on several advisory boards and speaks often to freelance communities and professional and investor groups. His PhD in psychology is from the University of Toronto. Before we started, John was just saying how much he loves Canada and uh, so he feels like an honorary citizen. So we, I said we would gladly adopt him. I, John has taught at the University of Michigan, Copenhagen Business School, the Indian School of Business and Wharton. He lives in New York City. John is also the author of the 2021 Global Study on Freelancing. Take it away, John. Oh, thank you, Sandra. Uh, um, let's do this if, if we can. Um, there are only about 15 people that are listening in, so let's turn it into a conversation. Hi. But... Yeah, that was very interesting. Anyway, so let's turn this into a kind of a conversation. So feel free, everybody, to to unmute if you'd like. Um, animal sounds probably not a good idea, but anything other than that would be terrific. And and uh, stop me at any time as we're going through this stuff. Ask me any question you have. We have about an hour, so instead of taking sort of twenty five minutes for me to talk and then twenty five minutes for questions, why don't we just sort of turn it into a stew, if, if, if that's okay. Um, let's also do this if we can. This is the stuff I'm gonna talk about. So if you have a question, you wanna make a comment, uh, feel free, jump right in. Just to, just give me a warning, cause I'm a fast talking old guy and I'll miss you unless you, you, um, you're a little bit like the road runner and just force me to stop. Uh, let me also apologize. We, we live on the corner of 72nd and 2nd. It, it's a bit like um, living on the corner of Bloor and Bay. So you, you can imagine it's sort of loud out there, even though we have double windows. Um, sometimes the, the, uh, the ambulances get through. So please excuse me. Uh, let me give you just a little bit of, of background on this, on this stuff. Um, 
I've been interested in freelancing for the last seven or eight years. We, we, uh, we were part of a consultancy called the RBL Group and another called the Novations Consulting Group. Some of you who might be part of HR are familiar with those names. And, and in the course of that work, we had about 30 or 40 people that worked for us part time. Uh, we called them stringers. What a terrible name that is, stringer, as if you were on a string and we were in charge. Terrible thing. Uh, and, and, and I became very interested in the whole concept of, of freelancing. In 2012, I was doing a project on HR strategy for McKesson. McKesson, some of you may remember, is a very, very large global pharmaceutical distribution company. And we had an HR strategy uh, process that we went through. And at the end, the head of HR said, what have you learned that would surprise us? And I said, what we've learned is that 30% of the people that work for McKesson are in employees. You don't know them. And you honestly, excuse my language, you don't give a shit about them. And that's a problem. And they were very surprised to hear that. But pretty quickly it became clear that the organization had used lots and lots of contractors or part-time experts in a variety of fields but didn't really know how to work with them many organizations don't know how to work well with freelancers and that's because freelancers are a unique group um, let's figure it somewhere around 200 million People are freelancers around the world. And what I mean by freelancers as opposed to gig workers is that these are people with credentials, with diplomas, with expertise in a particular profession, whether that profession is marketing or, or photography or videography or PR or writing, as many of the folks, Sandra, in your platform are. We're talking about many people who tend to work in five kinds of fields. One is tech, and we know about the various types of tech in freelancing, everything from AI and machine learning and robotics to building websites. We, we also know that a large percentage of people who are freelancing around the world, as well as Canada, are represented by Sandra Your platform, and that is people in, in the marketing business writ large. And so they, they may be former consultants or CMOs. They may be uh, supporting people in terms of PR. My daughter-in-law is a PR uh, representative in a really kind of cool firm. Uh, many of them are videographers, photographers, uh, uh, SEO experts, et cetera. Third category is independent management consultants. It's, it's sort of the youngest. If you, if you, let, me, let me take a step back. Uh, tech started in India and the U.S. Tech as freelancing started in India and the U.S. Uh, Europe was the dominant force early on in the work that Sandra, you and your platform are doing. It, they tended to happen early in um, the U.K. particularly because the premium that was being charged by agencies was just so high that it made all of the sense in the world. There was a 30% premium on top of anything that people were doing in the UK. And that's how people, companies like you know, Juno got started. Uh, third category is independent management consultants. Uh, you would see that there are lots of new firms that are being created that are different from McKinsey or Bain or BCG or the big four uh, because they tend to represent um, independent consultants, people that either worked for a big firm at one point or worked in industry and moved to consulting, but didn't want or couldn't get a job as a traditional consultant. Fourth is a, a wide variety of other freelance activities, and we'll get into that specifically in a minute. And last is, is hospitality and uh, travel, which represents in my city of New York, uh, almost, a, almost a half a million people are in that business writ large. And of course, they were some of the worst hit by, uh, by COVID. Um, it's been a very tough time as, as travel was curtailed, events were curtailed, hospitality has gone down, restaurants are open, et cetera. In, in January of this year, um, we, we 
decided that it was time to do a global study. Uh, when I say we, I mean the University of Toronto, my alma mater and, uh, and co-sponsor. And uh, we were very excited about, about this uh, because nobody had done a global study. There were lots of studies done about freelancers in the US, I think a bit on freelancers in Canada and, and all, kinds of all kinds of freelance platforms had done surveys to sort of market their own stuff. But nobody had kind of looked around the world. We did that. The University of Toronto was terrific. Uh, we, we were able to build partnerships with 77 platforms, similar to 76 plus Sandra's. And, and, uh, and we were able to, as, as she said, uh, attract 1,900 people from 30 plus countries to participate in this. So we don't just have US, we don't just have tech, we don't just have marketing, we don't have just English language, et cetera. We have, uh, the world has participated in some small way in, in this research. And these 11 points are what we found. And I'd like to go through them at, at a reasonable clip, um, but I would also love anybody to stop at any time and stop me at any time and say, well, what about this? Or, I don't understand that, or could you say that again in French or whatever? Uh, let's start with the first. Freelancing is a work and career innovation that's succeeding worldwide, though at different rates of adoption. And we know that, that there are different rates of adoption. Overall, we know there are somewhere between 800 and 1,000 platforms. We know there's something between 40 million and 160 million freelancers but we're not doing a very good job right now in identifying them. One of the reasons for that is that so many freelancers are in fact part-time freelancers. About three quarters globally of the people who are freelancing, remember again, these are people with, with professional designations, degrees, certificates, qualifications, who have worked in, as experts or specialists in, in, in a variety of fields. About three quarters of those folks have a full-time job and work on the side. And about a quarter are full-timers. Now that's important stuff to think about later on. And here's why. The fact that three quarters of these folks are freelancing part-time means that more and more employees in general are starting to think like freelancers. We call them freelance light. And if you think about the things that really define freelancing, there are three things that seem to drive what freelancers, what causes freelancers to become freelancers. They want greater autonomy, they want greater agency, and they want greater affiliation. Let me explain that just very simply. By autonomy, what it means is I want choice, flexibility, independence, I want to name my own hours, I want to work where I want to work, etc. Agency is a second factor. I want to have impact. I, I don't want to feel like a cog in, cog in somebody else's machine. I want to get things done. And I want to choose what those things are. And third, affiliation. It's lonely out there. Remember that we did this survey in the middle of COVID-19 when it was lonely for everybody. And if you're an independent working from your home, it is lonely out there for so many people, whether you're working with others or not. And so those three, autonomy, agency, and affiliation, have identified what freelancers are looking for. And by the way, what part-time freelancers are looking for just as much, but asking for it from their job, which has very interesting implications. The second piece of this is important, and that is it's a work and career innovation. And what I mean by that is that the career isn't freelancing. Freelancing is the way in which you do your career. If you're a marketer, you do marketing. If you're SEO, you do SEO, but you are doing it as an independent. Let me say that in a slightly different way, as a small business owner. We sometimes use the term solopreneur, a person who's an entrepreneur, but by him or herself, and that defines it. The third is, though at different rates of adoption, and what you'll see is that the US is very strong in adoption, the UK and Europe very strong, Canada is getting there just a little bit slower than some other places. We're also seeing some other places that are getting, getting comfortable with freelancing, even though the culture 
maybe one of, if you're a freelancer, does that mean you're not quite as good? If you're a freelancer, does that mean you can't really keep a job? If you're a freelancer, does that mean that you won't be loyal when something else comes along, you'll blow me off at a critical time? I mean, all the, those sorts of myths have been problematic in places like Latin America, Asia, Africa, and some parts of, of Eastern Europe. But overall, what we've experienced is, and I'll give you data point number one, 60% of the people in our survey say they either have enough work or they have too much work. Isn't that wonderful? These are people that describe themselves as having good relationships with clients. 63% say they will meet their financial goals. 90% of companies say that they're interested in using freelancers more, not less. And 60% of our freelancers are committed to either their full or part-time freelance career. So this is overall a, a good news with one caveat, and that is You'll see later on, 38% of freelancers in our survey didn't have enough work. And how can we help them? We'll get to that in a minute. Second, the freelance revolution is large and growing. I love that line. It's the old line we used to say at McKinsey, right? Companies either large or growing or competition is increased and, or fragmenting or something like that. But it really is large and growing. Among our data set, about 20% were US, about 40% were Europe, and what I mean is everywhere from uh, Russia all the way to the Netherlands. So we, we, weren't, we didn't have a large enough population to sort of dice it by specific country, and so we had to use large segments. But a, about 60% are in those developed countries. Then we have 8% in Southeast Asia, we have 11% in Africa, we have 16% in Latam, and some other parts of the world as well. So we're not only seeing it grow in the developed world, we're seeing it grow in the developing world as well. Third, there is no one type of freelancer. There's a, there's a, a, a funny belief in some cases that freelancers are young men sitting in trees coding between 12 midnight and 8 in the morning. I, I, I don't quite know where that came from, but it's pretty crazy. Let me give you a list of people who are freelancing these days. Musicians, rocket scientists, architects, engineers, film documentarians, freelance diplomats, investment bankers, M&A lawyers, baristas, marketers, SEO experts, writers, videographers, photographers, and the list goes on. There is hardly a profession now that doesn't have an interest by freelancers, including surgeons, including physicians of different types, et cetera, et cetera. More importantly, they're not all young men coding. 30%, I'm 69, so I'm very pleased to say this, 30% of the population of freelancers in our study are over 50. And of that population, only a minority of those people are between jobs freelancing until they get a job. So a majority of those folks are either part-time or full-time freelancers. Not all young people, about the same amount of men and women, people that identify as men versus people who identify as women. We didn't have a third category of people who were fluid, but you know, we only had 1,900 people entirely. Uh, but what we know is that it, it, it is a robust and large population, and it's going to continue to get larger and more robust. Fourth, freelancers are by and large optimistic and confident despite business challenges and COVID-19. You'd think that that would knock them down, but it doesn't. Let me give you a list of some of the ways in which people describe themselves. We took a long list of attributes and asked them to define themselves relative to that, more or less. And our freelancers are more optimistic or more persuasive. They have greater grit. They are more resilient. They have strong client relationships. They are good at networking. They are confident and they work well with others. Who the hell wouldn't want to hire somebody like that? That's a fabulous list of criteria. It's a wonderful thing. 
and be and and what we what we see is that that is the case across the board. You would think that the most frustrated people in the world this past March would be the people in the hospitality and travel industry, which represents a large vertical within freelancing. You would think that they would be pulling their hair out, but they are excited, they're enthusiastic, they are ready to go back to work, and they know that, as the story goes, there's a pony in there somewhere. So very, very important to understand that these are people that you want to work with. Next, number five, it's important to recognize freelancing as a source of public good. You know, freelancing is a source of public good in about three ways. One is Matt Barry, and I don't know how many of you have heard that name. Matt Barry was one of the early pioneers in freelancing and the creator, the founder of freelancer.com. It's an Australian based uh, platform. It's the largest platform in the world. It has about 58 million people on the platform. And not all of them are freelancers. Some of them are gigsters. I used them when I was drawing, when I was creating, um, uh, what would you call it? Uh, children's books for my two grand, for two of my four grandchildren. And, and what happened if I use that example is I was able to pay somebody from Bangladesh $150 per book to do 10 illustrations per book. Freelancing was able to take that person who had obvious talent and provide them with opportunity that they would not have had in Bangladesh otherwise, and not certainly enough. So it is a leveler in terms of creating economic opportunity for people who have the talent and are willing to do the work. And technology has been very important around, around that. Second, by doing so, it reduces financial inequality. Inequality that's premised on something no more than the accident of where we happen to be born. Third, we are seeing that, that freelancing is able to provide essential services to parts of the world that don't have those essential services available and therefore grow the economy of those areas. We are seeing fabulous things happening in Africa. We're seeing wonderful things happening in, in Latin America, etc. And finally, John, can I just stop you right there? Um, yeah. I'm very curious about that. Can you give an example of um, this uh, reducing inequality and in some of the public good happening in Africa? Or Latin sure. Africa? I, absolutely. As an example of that, I'm actually talking to Africa tomorrow. And, and one of the things, it turns out Ethiopia, and, and one of the things that's happening as one example is, is that a company called NS Work is working closely with technical people, technical experts uh, from South Africa. They're able to provide opportunities in the EU for these folks. That means that they're able to get about a 30% bump in their pay relative to working in South Africa. And at the same time, they're offering an, op an opportunity for their companies in the EU to get a discount on that cost. And so, one small example is the degree to which they're, they're bringing wealth to that country. But let me give you a, a broader example, and that is uh, in, in India, we have about a million too many freelancers, in, people with skills in tech. Relative to what's happening in the world, we have too many in India and not enough in many other places. In fact, 200,000 short in Canada. Well, we're creating opportunity for Indian nationals to work in Canada. They may or may not end up coming across and living in Canada. They may continue to enjoy working wherever they are and living wherever they are in India, but they're providing value to Canada. And at the same time, Canada is providing economic progress to India. Third example. Some of the companies are doing wonderful things. And I bet if you look, Sandra, you're doing wonderful things too. One specific case, Colab Tree in the UK is a platform for scientists. They played a very important role in developing vaccines for COVID-19. There's another platform, in this case, the US called LifeSci Hub, which is already beginning to do some work in Canada. 
They're in the business of providing pharma companies with project management and quality assurance. That is really important stuff. There aren't enough project managers and quality assurance people that in, in pharma as an institution, pharma has been very reluctant to step out that only has historically wanted to work with people who've had 20 years in the pharma industry and in their company. These guys are building much broader opportunity for people to participate. If I use the last example, it's called Spacely.Work, and they're in the business of helping uh, uh, satellites, excuse me, <coughs> helping satellites to, to not only get up there, but stay up there. And what we know is that satellites are extremely important these days as a communications medium. We'll put 3,000 satellites in, in the atmosphere in 2022, and, and there are some important folks helping to make that happen through Spacely.org. So a wide variety of examples, and there, I could give you a dozen more, but the big message is we're not only doing well, we're doing good. Next, freelance platforms must continue to add value to freelancers. You know, too many freelance platforms think of freelancers as widgets. And we're just going to have as many widgets as we possibly can, because who knows? I mean, you know, I may have a need for uh, this person or that person once a year. Well, the problem is they're not widgets, they're people. And so we need to do a better job of creating opportunity for freelancers and value for freelancers, or they're not going to join our platforms. There are five things that freelance platforms need to do well. One, they need to give people work. Two, they need to show that there's a continuing flow of work, which reminds people of the value of remaining part of that platform, part of that community. I'll be invested in that community to the extent that I see continued opportunity. And so just little things like saying, here are the opportunities of the week becomes really important for people in terms of knowing how, how should I participate in this one. And since most people in our study said they're only part of one or two platforms, it's even more important for platforms to provide a, a transparency on the number and range of opportunities provided. Third, Freelance platforms need to do a better job or a good job of providing freelancers with the basic administrative and business tools that they need to run their business. At the end of the day, freelancers are independent. They're small business owners, just like any other small business owner. I used to live on the corner of Quebec and Annette streets in Toronto way back when. And there was a wonderful little family that ran a grocery store, bodega, we call them now in the United States. And, and, you know, it's no different being a freelancer in the marketing space. You need to have a vision. You need to have a strategy. You need to have a brand name. You need to do the things that you need to do in any business. It's just that you have one, you have one employee in most cases, and that's you. So important for freelancing platforms to provide those services and increasingly to provide services that help them to live a full life. For example, in the US, it's really important that we provide a way for people who get what we call 1099 or independent workers. It's very hard for them to get mortgages. It's very hard for them to, to be paid on time or, or for us to income smooth their pay so that they're able to get paid, they're able to live their lives. It's very important that they have access to credit. It's people need to buy a car, but if you're a 1099 or an independent and you don't have a job, quote unquote, it's a lot tougher. And so we, we need to provide those kinds of services. That's something that the platform needs to work with banks, etc. on. Fourth, very important for platforms to help our freelancers stay up to date. You know, the half-life uh, of, 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 of artificial intelligence is about three years. The half-life of robotics is about 18 months. The half-life of machine learning is less than that. In, if you think about 
marketing and and uh, and the area of, of marketing and and the work that you're doing, Sandra, one of the things that people need to understand is that there's more and more tech associated with that. You may be a wonderful marketing expert, but if you don't understand digital transformation, it's going to be tough for you to get work going into the future. And so freelance platforms need to help people to skill up and make sure that they've got future, they are future proofed, as we would call it, in terms of their skill set. Finally, it's very important as a fifth thing for, for, for platforms to provide a community for its members, just as you are doing now, Sandra, providing an update in terms of what's going on in the world and giving an opportunity for people to collaborate. Next, it's time for platforms to help freelancers by helping clients to be better. 45% of our freelancers said, my clients know how to work with freelancers. What that means is that 55% of the companies that they're working with don't. And what does it mean that they're not good at working with freelancers? Well, here are the things that, that good companies do when they work well with freelancers. One, they have a clear philosophy. They understand what they're trying to do and when they're trying to do it with freelancers. Is it really sort of on demand only when necessary or are they a rel or they are continuing part of how we do things. Second, performance management is really important for freelancers. I need, I need to know I've done a good job for you in order to get my next job. It's a very different notion than performance management as an employee. So I need realistic deliverables. I need realistic timeframes. I need realistic expectations about the work. I need regular feedback. And you know, many companies don't understand that. And so one of the roles for a platform is to teach companies how to do a better job of working with freelancers. In addition to performance management, what does that look like? Well, a majority of marketing folks in our survey say that while companies are very clear that they have high standards, they're not clear that many of the folks that are managing them are good at managing freelancers, not employees, but freelancers. Freelancers are not employees. They, they are volunteers. They are peers. They are agreeing to work with you, not required to work with you because you control their pay and rations. And so very important for especially new project managers inside companies to get skills in working with freelancers. And it's one of the most important ways that platforms can help. Fourth. John, can you stop on that one just for a sec? Um, sure. I want to explore that a bit. Um, so what would you say the difference between managing a freelancer is and managing an employee? What do managers of freelancers need to understand and know? Sure. You know, uh, at the end of the day, if, if, if I'm a, from a manager of a of an employee, my relationship, excuse me for saying so, is kind of colonialist, isn't it? I mean, I get to say where they are, when they are, and where they're not. I don't get to do that with freelancers. With freelancers, my obligation is to provide a, a piece of work and a set of relationships and a context that makes it attractive to them. They don't have to do this. They can choose to work for somebody else or to work for another organization. So there's a different kind of a logic here. It's not you owe me, I own you, but rather I'm, I'm inviting you to do this work with me. Let's talk about how we get it done together so that it's done very well. Now, now that's something that a lot of freelancers don't realize. They don't realize their power and their freedom because it's so easy to slip back into being a quote, employee, but they're not employees. They are independent business people that are choosing to work for the right amount of money and the right conditions. And that's where the thing starts. It's a mind, it, Sandra, it's a mind shift first. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's really good. That, um, cause then uh, you're, 
redefining that relationship and knowing going in there, you have a lot more negotiating power. Can you tell us about a um, platform that is helping clients be better clients that you sure. are doing that well? Sure. Um, I, I'm, I'm very impressed with G2I. I, I happen to, I, I'm the coach them and I'm on their advisory board, but I, I'm excited to give you the example. They're, they're a US based, they do uh, mostly mobile apps. Uh, they're Java based as a technology. They're in the tech side. And, uh, and Gabe Greenberg has a very interesting way of thinking about this. He says, uh, we work up to 50 hours a week, but that's it. So it, it, the first thing that he does is make it really clear that uh, um, th there are limits to what you can expect from his freelancers, right? They have a life too. Second, uh, they, they visit with the freelance, they visit with the clients once a month. They collect feedback from both free freelancer and from the client on how well they're doing. And I'll talk about that in a second. And they sit down with the client once a month and say, how's it going? Every once in a while, they say, you know, you're really not working very well with our freelancers. You're, you're abusive, you're this, or you're that. You know, let's, let's reset this relationship or perhaps you should work with some other organization. In other words, they, they take their obligation as the, the representative, if I may put it that way, uh, of the freelancer quite seriously. I like that a lot. They, uh, if you were to ask Gabe um, what, what his vision is, his vision is healthy work and a healthy work life for his freelancers. That's great. Marianne just posted in the chat an advocate. They're advocates for their freelancers. And that's, of course, what, what we must be. What we must be. Well done. Well done. Well done. Uh, next, um, I, I didn't mention two or three other pieces that I want to mention. So if you think about what, what freelance companies need to do very well, number one, they need to be clear about their philosophy when they use and when they don't use freelancers. Second, they need to be good at performance management. Third, they need to train their managers to work with freelancers, uniquely work with freelancers as opposed to seeing them as just another category of employee. Fourth, very important that, that we treat freelancers as part of the team. You know, it's so easy to sort of hold them at arm's length. You have a different color card when you walk in, if you walk in, or you're not allowed to go to this meeting, you can't join this training, et cetera it's silly. It's just absolutely silly. It's very important that you treat freelancers as part of your overall team for the period that they're working with you and for you. Fifth, there's some stuff that freelancers can't do. They can't do it because they don't have the relationships. They can't do it because they're not allowed to have access to that information. They can't do it because it's secret IP. Whatever those are, make sure that the job fits the capabilities and the limitations of your freelancers. S setting, setting out a clear role in a clear project is very important, just as important as it is with an employee. And last but not least is treat them fairly and with respect and pay them on time. I had a conversation yesterday with Liz, what's, What's Liz? I forgot Liz's last name. Anyway, she'll, I hope she's not listening. Barkley. Liz is the, is the commissioner of small business for the UK. And, uh, and Liz said the biggest challenge the UK has with, with freelancers is making sure they get paid on time. It's so easy for them to, to, to be uh, mistreated, if I may put it that way. Not acceptable. Not acceptable. Next. When it comes to freelance work portfolios, the magic is in the mix. The big message around this one, Sandra, is to be thoughtful about the portfolio. You know, people that, people that work only for the public sector are the least happy freelancers in our population. They don't feel as though they're treated very well. They think their expectations are too demanding and uh, they are paid less than equivalent work in the pub, in the private sector. Uh, what we also find is that people who only work for big companies or only work for small companies and startups 
are not as happy, are not as 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 uh, satisfied than people who have a portfolio that includes some of both. From the big companies, you get the benefits of working in longer projects. From the small companies, you get the benefit of more innovation, more creativity, more openness to change, more speed, etc. And so, the real message here is. Think carefully and thoughtfully about the mix of your business and define it as an important part of how you manage your business. Number 10, it's still tough out there for many. And this is the point we made earlier. And that is 38% of people who are freelancing don't have enough work. Well, what do we do for those folks? One of the things that a freelance platform can do is identify new and different adjacencies. I've written about two very recently. One is, uh, have you thought about a, 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 a sub stack or other uh, newsletter for which you are paid? Are you doing the kind of thing that you think would be of interest to other people that they might pay you 10 or $15 a week to be part of your insights in a particular area? I wrote recently about the, the topic of online courses. Many of the folks in your platform have a lot to teach and people could be interested in the online courses that they make available. So in addition to your regular freelance, there are other adjacencies that you can choose to take advantage of, whether it's online classes or it's teaching or it's newsletters or it's expert uh, providing expertise through an expert network, or it's an interim management job where you're working part-time for a year, let's say 20% of your time for a particular client. There are ways in which you can continue to grow your income. And that requires adding new services. Platforms can provide a really helpful addition to that. Number 10. Practice coopetition, support the rising tide that will lift all boats. Um, the message here is that, that there's a nice head of steam around freelancing in Canada. And the best way to build it to a crescendo is for freelance platforms to work together. So part of this is if, if you remember your old economics 101, you know, you've got two hot dog stands. Do you put them at opposite ends of the beach or do you put them together? And the answer is you always put them together. Absolutely. You build the market. We chat, we are challenged by the importance of building the market in Canada and in every other major country for freelancing. The best way to do that is for freelance platforms to get together. It is possible for you to compete in many areas, but at the same time to cooperate in growing freelancing as an accepted career and work innovation. And finally, COVID-19 has, has had two impacts. One is a lot more people freelancing part and full time. Some of those folks are temporary until they get another job. Others of those folks are continuing to freelance. So we know there's more competition in certain areas. And we know that marketing is an area where there's been greater competition. We also know that there's greater opportunity. And that what's happened in so many ways is that the shift from going to the office to remote has decreased the difference between a freelancer and an employee. There's not much difference anymore between a freelancer and an employee that's working from home. And, and let's use that by creating more opportunities again, through coopetition for folks to, to, take advantage of, of the fact that COVID-19 and tech together have really helped freelancing to be much more mainstream. Now that's what we've learned. And, and I apologize for being such a blabbermouth. I've taken too much time. Are there questions that I can answer? Do you want to uh, stop the screen share and we'll go to- uh... sure. You on speaker view, and then people can go ahead and ask questions. Feel free to unmute yourself if you like, or post something in the chat, and I will read it out. If you have a comment or a question, go ahead. 
Yeah, I was I was wondering um, when you're saying that uh, the freelancing opportunity is supplying opportunities for people uh, like the tech people in India or or the ones in Ethiopia. Um, now there is also the other side of that 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 um, it could very well bring down the rates of pay for people in developed worlds uh, or developed countries. And so I see, I don't know, in my mind, I'm thinking that the COVID effect on freelancing is also going to lower the um, lifestyle living for people in developed countries. Would you say that's true? You know, I, I, I think that there's, let me think long and hard about that, but briefly. I, I think, Janet, my argument would be that the, the race to the bottom will be a function of commodity skills. So we're always going to see things getting lower and lower and lower and lower when, when supply demand impacts it. Let me turn it and ask the question, and I hope you don't mind if I ask you specifically. Janet, is there an area where you are truly an expert? Where, where you believe that what you bring to the party is something that an awful lot of people don't bring to the party. It's a rare set of skills. Well, uh, one, one area where you were actually touching on was um, illustration. And I had worked as an illustrator for quite some time before uh, taking a mommy break. And so uh, when I came back into the workforce, I found that the the illustrators that I talked to who had stayed in the workforce during that time said it's it's a lot tougher because yes. um, the uh, you know a lot of illustration is sticking around on the internet and being used as stock as well as a lot of supply from other countries and so um, because you don't have to speak the language to supply an image then yeah. those images can they can come from other countries where the cost of living is lower totally so true. I so but I did not choose, yeah, I didn't choose to renew my uh, career area in illustration, but uh, you know, it was an area that I was pretty good at. So let me give you the counter to that. And I love your point, which is great. I, 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 I wanted to do uh, little children's books for each of my grandchildren. I have two that are two years old and two that are now six months old, so they're not ready for it. Uh, I learned something really neat about that area. I, what I learned was that if you were established as a children's book illustrator, your rates were much higher than if you were identified as a generalist who might draw uh, children's books, but you might do other things. And so what I, what I think I learned from that, and I've tested it in a couple of other cases, and it seems to work, is that our challenge if we don't want to sort of a if we don't want a, 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 a drive to the bottom in our in our fees we have to connect ourselves to an area of growth demand and exclusivity and in a sense that's just like any business i mean it's, it's like you've got three stores on a street how do you you know you're all selling clothes how do you distinguish yourself we have the same challenge in freelancing. And, and what I learned, just to give you a sense of magnitude, is when I spoke to people who were really, really well connected in the children's book area, the cost of 10 illustrations was about $6,000. When I asked for general illustrations, it was about $400. And the only difference that I could find was that the folks that were charging 6,000 were, were very good, but they weren't so much better than the others, but they had established themselves as part of a community in which their, their price level was able to stay maintained. I don't know if that works in everything, but I, but I do believe that your ability to identify your skills as special, unique, rare, uh, unavailable broadly, and connected with a particular uh, community that's growing and, and demanding it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Does that help? Yes, yes, I like the, um, 
the growth uh, demand and uh, exclusivity formula. Yeah, yeah. And it, by the way, wonderful apartment. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's a fake one. Oh no! <laughs> I was so jealous. Oh, okay, but but uh, one one last point is that um, sure. Sanders Group is, you know, you you are helping people to find their their exclusive niche. Um, that's one part of the collaboration platform yes. to, to really focus down on what we do best. And that was also to your first question: What do you think you do best? Yes. You know, there are some organizations, Sandra, I don't know if you do this, and, and you know, only a few are large enough to sort of manage this, but there are some folks that really do a nice job of, of providing coaching as a service, and it's a paid service. But you can imagine that some of the folks in, in your platform, similar to MBO Partners or some other places, uh, may benefit from having access to a coach that says, let me see if I can help you to identify an area where growth is happening, where you bring rare skills, et cetera, et cetera. That, that may be something that would be of interest to people either individually or um, as, a, as a smaller group. And it may also be, Janet, that, that this is something where you might teach other people and it could be an adjacent source of income for you. So th there are lots of ways to sort of spin this compass. That's great. I love it. And I think um, to your point about um, adjacent services, that's awesome. It, the platform we use has a built in learning platform. And there's certainly opportunity for freelancers to offer a course and it be a revenue sharing for co labor nation and a freelancer yes. teaching their services. Absolutely. The other thing I would say, and Sandra, this may or may not be interesting to you, there are lots of folks around the world who are, in, who are climbing the same tree, if I may put it that way. Um, and, and, you know, happy to introduce you to, to that international group um, because, you know, it's, it's always better to work with, to, with others, you know. I um, met with um, somebody from Vicoland that you exactly. recommended. And I reached out to them because you recommended them in the study. So, and I'm absolutely using principles from the study to shape co-labor nation. It's really, cool. really helpful. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Any other questions? Similar space a couple of years ago. Um, and what worked for me was, you know, even though I couldn't, um, you know, do work on the side, I got involved in the public forums really heavily. It helped me keep up on my job, but also helped me make a lot of really good relationships, um, like all over the world. Um, I specifically targeted Reddit. And I was in, a, I'm in a role where it's coding and ads um, and it's very specialized. And mm -hmm. so I was able to take, you know, things I was learning in my job and apply them and help others and then take the learnings that others had and apply them to my job. Mm -hmm. Help me, you know, really be successful, but I never made any additional revenue from that in the three years I was working for the company that had a non-compete. Right. I switched to another company uh, that didn't have a non-compete. It was a you know, decent raise as well. And um, once I did that, I started taking jobs on the side. It was a year and a half later that I had so much work on the side that it became my full-time business. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's and I love great. that. I love that. James, wonderful. You know, you know, the, the idea of start slow, build, you know, build confidence, build experience, figure out whether it works for you. I, 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 I think that's great advice. And, and it sounds like I don't think you're going to go hungry with your skill set. <laughs> Thanks. That's a good, good to know. One I just wanted, I wanted to add to Jane, what James said too, um, cause I've found a lot of, um, sort of freelancing support and help on, uh, on Facebook. I'm that demographic. I'm sorry, but, <laughs> um, but <laughs> I, <laughs> I joined, um, a few binders groups. And so, so the binders groups are actually, fairly exclusive to women and uh, non-binary people, um, but um, are incredibly helpful uh, for your profession. You can narrow it down to whatever you want to focus on. Like I belong to an editor's binders group, a communicator's binders group, 
um, Canadian binders specifically. Um, and they're just a really great resource for, for job leads and for anything that you're, you know, you're stumped about. Um, you can post it there and there's such a great range of people who, who can help you sort of. Oh, I gotta go. I think that's wonderful. Can I add one other thing? And that, and that is nice to meet you, James. Lori, and what I love about what you just said, it, it, I'm a writer and, and I have seen the demise of copy editing and it just frustrates the hell out of me because it's hard to read anything without <laughs> seeing mistakes. And, and, and so I, I would like to vote for um, a, a copy editing sub Reddit or sub a group with, within Sandra, your platform. I think that I think that copy editing is going to return. I think editing in general will return. And, and I, I think you guys ought to catch that wave. It's, I, I really do believe that there's a tremendous need in that area that has been unfulfilled for the last few years. When I worked in communications, we always said that people thought of communications uh, sort of professionals as the last, the last thing you tack on to your project, mm. other than bringing them in at the very beginning. And I sort of feel like editors, copy editing and that sort of thing is, is kind of the same same uh, treated the same way yes and very important stuff and increasingly important stuff as so much of our of our stuff is is, is read how about if we take one more question anybody else well i was taught that if you leave five minutes early you're a hero and if you leave five minutes late you're a shithead so i'm going to go with hero <laughs> <laughs> so i John, I just want to thank you so much. This has been so informative. And oh, my pleasure. I've been following your work for the last year and a half or so, have just loved it. And if you want to continue uh, drinking from the fountain here that John's uh, putting uh -oh. out, follow him on LinkedIn. You'll see all kinds of great articles. He posts really regularly. And uh, yeah, as I posted before, if you want to check out Co-Labor Nation, you know, go to our website or send me an email. Thanks again. And, Lovely. Uh, thank you for setting this up, Sandra. You're a wonderful host. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. See you later. See you guys. Bye now.